Do the unbelievers who are headed to hell, uh, do they also, are they also raised in the last day? And the answer is yes. And so here we learn this in, in the catechism in the third article, right? Um, the Holy Spirit's job calls God as light, sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth, keeps it with Jesus Christ and one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily works and forgives all my sins, the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead. Okay, so that's everybody. And give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. So, so yes, so resurrection is for everyone. That's why it says in Scripture that every everyone will every every knee will bow and, and so forth. I mean, even the people who live their life in rebellion to God, scoffing Him, will have to acknowledge Him. So they go to hell and they have to go back. So they yes, yeah, so that so that again, death is body and soul separated. Okay, right. uh, and then. Heaven for for a time, and then the resurrection, then eternal life. Same thing for hell, um, and so forth. And uh, it reminds me of a book. Said, What's that? Still burn in hell, then? Yes, and and in body and soul, in torments. So yeah. Haven't they been taught that we will see them go to hell? Well, yeah. I mean, everything that happens on the last day will be in front of. Everyone. So we'll see it. Well, that's the vindication, right? I mean, it, it talks about that in, in Revelation about how the those who were martyred uh, plead for that kind of vengeance, and that's what comes. Yeah. So, yeah, Dave. 
different subject totally. Okay. <laughs> we believe that God is all knowing. Yes. As we read the Old Testament prophets, it sounds like God makes up his mind as he goes. Yeah. And from our perspective, he does. God does, quote unquote, change his mind. Sometimes the King James even says he repents. Right? Yes. And it's it's from our perspective that it, it, it looks like he's changed his mind. But yet he knows all along. Well, it's confusing. So. It's absolutely confusing. <laughs> this is where you say the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men, right? Um, that it, it is a kind of uh, 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 paradox and conundrum, the idea of God changing his mind. But it is only from our perspective that that would be the case. So, and that is a good example of, a, of our limitations of our reason. That we can't always comprehend these things. But it says it. So, yeah. Good question. That's well, not on the same track as the previous questions. Potentially, well, immensely harder. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why? Yeah, why does he keep it? It doesn't. He's revealed everything we need to know for salvation. No, but it's so difficult. To... Do, you do you think we could handle the inner counsels of God? <laughs> Maybe it's a mercy then that he doesn't try to show us. Right? <laughs> eh? Yeah, I mean, why does God withhold and hide things? Because, I mean, it's the same way that when he comes to us, he hides in the flesh and blood of Jesus. The incarnation is God coming down to us in a way that we can receive him as sinners. I mean, if, if he came to us and revealed his mind to us, we as poor, miserable sinners, frail, fragile, and so forth, our minds couldn't handle it. Plain and simple. We're way too fragile of vessels for that kind of stuff. So what we have been given is his revelation in human language of the scriptures, right? That, that we can handle, that we can receive, that we can study. We're going to certainly have our questions at times, uh, but, but that's his condescension to us. And I don't mean that in the negative, arrogant way. I just mean that in the sense that he's... So far up there that, that to, he's got to come to us because we can't ascend to him. So he has to come down to our level. And that's how he does. And he reveals to us what is needful, what is necessary for our salvation. No, he doesn't reveal all the mysteries of heaven and earth to us. I don't think we can handle the mysteries of heaven and earth. Right? So, yeah. All right. Okay. So, um, along the way, I want to take some of these little side trips on some things as I'm studying to come some of the cross. Um, as a Christian, it's often summarized your existence is to be in the world, but not of the world. Okay? So I want to show to you what the scriptures lay out, um, especially the Old or the New Testament lays out of what it means to be of the world. Now, what this means is this is what you've been rescued from, but it is also meant for you to gain a certain wisdom about the world and its ways. That as you are in the world, you have to be a part of the world, you cannot avoid the world, you can still be on guard for the ways of the world, and, and so forth, and no what it is the world is going to try to give you, even if it's smiling at you and wanting you to join it. Okay? So, so the world is busy seeking after things. And so we might have heard this similarly, uh, I've just been a little bit of seek after the kingdom of God and his righteous. But what does the world seek after? It seeks after power, glory, honor for itself, riches, which is all part of power. Um, might, strength, all these things. So that's what the world's goal is. It, its goal is to amass for itself these things. Okay? The world is full of sin. So when, when John declares in John chapter 1, when, when John the Baptist declares, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, he's, he's actually also saying the world is full of sin. 
Yes, he's declaring Jesus to be the Messiah, the Lamb of God, but he's also saying the world is full of sin. Okay? That's, that's what Adam and Eve bring in. Okay? The world hates Christ, and thus it hates Christians. This is an article of faith, because you may not see this always, and many, if you've lived, you know, more than 20 to 30 years in this world and in this country, you may remember a time when the world was much more friendly to you, but this is still very much true, because Jesus taught this. John 15 and John 17 in particular, he's talking uh, on Monday, Thursday to his disciples about the world hating him, and how it, because their connection to him, the world will hate them. And so it is a matter of faith, because you might not always see the hatred of the world, but you need to know it's still there, because your Lord says it's there. Okay? Now, it's becoming much more clear and much more obvious, certainly, but it's still a matter of faith. I believe it, because Jesus says so. These are all points of Scripture that we should absolutely believe. Like, even if we're not seeing this, like, oh, is the world really full of sin? I see a lot of pagans trying to do good for each other. No, it's still full of sin. Oh, you know, the people that do good things for others, you know, they're not just seeking it from No, they are. The Word of God says this. And the Word of God is more true than our perception of the world around us. Okay? Um, so it hates Christ. It hates Christians. It is ignorant of God. But it is not free from judgment. Okay? So, so its ignorance is not like an innocence ignorance, uh, just a certain in, innocent naivety, right? But it is a willful ignorance because the scriptures declare, uh, Romans 1 especially, that creation attests to the existence of God and who God is and so forth. So the world is not off the hook. Even if they never darken the door of a church or hear anything from the Bible, they're still not off the hook. They are still ignorant of God, and that itself brings judgment. And that goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. When they sinned, they put, as Romans 5 puts it, in Adam all die. Because of what Adam had done, all humanity goes with him. Okay, so for all the people who want to sit there and, you know, well, but what about this person? They never done anything wrong. It comes back to Adam. You understand that, but again, a Western mindset, an American Western mindset, can't understand, because we're so individualistic, that there's a connection between us and Adam. And that our fathers have a big determination on where we're at. But that connection of the generations goes all the way back to Adam. And of course, we just can't think that way. We don't think that way naturally. Our, our Western mindsets are far too individualistic for that. Okay? So again, as we talked just a moment ago, the wisdom of this world is foolish with God. So God chooses to, to reveal amongst the world foolish things. You know, he, he uses foolish things like speaking words to do great miraculous things, and the world would consider that foolishness. You know, the world, if, if you're going to do something great in the world, what are you going to need? What's that? Power. But you can get through money, uh, strength, influence, and that's how you're wise and great in the world. Well, God chooses things like weakness, things like words, the very thing that, you know, we teach school children to not worry about so much at the playground, right? Don't worry about the words that are said. Shrug them off. Well, that's good for the playground, but God chooses words to make the dead alive. Okay. Both, as you heard today, physically, but also spiritually. Okay. The world is full of immoral people. But note what I say there, which cannot be avoided. Okay, so I'm going to actually go to this one, which can be inspired now. Okay. So here's Paul's uh, advice to the Corinthian congregation, the Christians there. I wrote to you in my in the in my letter. Uh, so there's a there's another letter to the Corinthians, not scripture. This one is. All right. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. 
Okay. So not to associate. There's your E there. You want to follow along in the Greek. Um, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy, the swindlers, or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. Insert a footnote on monasteries and convents, right? Because that was the whole goal of this. Oh, we're going to separate from the world. Well, the scripture says you can't do that. Because you'd have to go out of the world. And God has you in the world. So you can't avoid these people. You can't avoid this. But notice also he's talking in particular about the sexually immoral in the church. Okay, so first is the pagan world. He gives that little lesson on the pagan world. You're going to find greedy swindlers, idolaters. You can't avoid them. Nor should you. But I am now writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. Okay. See, God's word is really strict with regards to fellowship within Christianity. You want to bear the name Christian. Scriptures give us a much higher standard of, inter of our interactions. Right? Um, this is where he'll go, you know, judge judgment begins in the household of God. Well, that's, that's, so this is, a, this is a part of living in this world because the temptation always put before us is to render judgment upon the, in the world, which is easy pickings. Pagans being pagans. It's not hard to judge. They're pagans. This is what they do. This is who they are. But the scriptures lay out within the church. Now, if you want to be known as a Christian and act these ways, now we have problems. Okay? These need to be addressed. Okay. So what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among them. Okay. Um, just great verses to keep our mindset proper towards the outside world, but on the other side, proper here. Are you your brother's keeper? Yes, absolutely. And brother being the word there for Christian. Absolutely. We are to look out for one another. That's what it is to love each other. Okay. And when you have someone approach you and ask you a question or help you out or you know try to help you in this way, you ought to receive it as love, not as judgment, contention, or the ways, you know, the same ways the pagans would receive you if you approach them about it. Okay? <laughs> you want to receive that with the loving rebuke, the loving admonition that it is. Okay. But again, this is in when you're in the world, you're gonna just run into this. Yeah, here. Christians do the same thing. They do. That's what he's kind of implying here, too, right? So, so in my view, yeah. There's not a lot of good things except that the pagans could care less. True. Okay. And the Christian is sovereign. Hopefully. So yeah, but but one of the one of the things God uses to get us to be sorry and to repent is our brothers or sisters in Christ teaching us, right? I mean, sometimes we won't know unless somebody would say to us, "Hey, watch out! You're 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 getting kind of you know." We wouldn't know that unless somebody said it to us because oftentimes we are very much blind to our own sins. This is the whole. Judge not, you know, you take them to log out of your own eye. Well, this is how this happens as we interact as brothers, you know. And so, yes, the implication here is that you're going to find sin in the church. But there's a very different way of dealing with sin in the church, and that is through repentance and forgiveness. But in order for there to be repentance, of course, there is a word of law, a word of rebuke, a word of admonition that needs to happen so that you would know your sin. And then, as Christian, then what do you do with that? Well, you confess your sin, and you receive forgiveness of that sin. I mean, that's that's the difference. The world will try to explain the sin, 
um, if they care, right? In many cases, they just don't care. But if they if they do care, they'll explain it away. Uh, I had to because they'll justify it. Um, they'll get really defensive about it. They'll try to, you know, it's not sin. It wasn't wrong. Everybody does it. Um, or they'll just get defensive and be like, how dare you talk to me like that? But I mean, but in the church, the way the Christian would receive this would be, you're right. I'm sinning. God, God has mercy on me. And then the Christian brother is to be like, you know, Nathan to David, you know, like, oh yes, well, God forgives you. That's we're Christians. So well, the thing I have noticed is it seems to me, I mean, in the last number of years is that the pagan and people were not only don't care, they're actually defending. Yeah, well, well sure. Yeah. So so when you're most insecure, oftentimes, right? When you're when you're most insecure about something, you oftentimes have put forward a strong front. Right? And so what the pagans do with their pride is they're actually revealing their insecurity. Because in order to feel comfortable in their way of sin, their way of death, they have to celebrate it to try to make it look like it isn't a way of death, right? And then they try to get a crowd because the more of you that can come together, the more, you know, and, and this is, you know, this is uh, Tower of Babel, right? Yeah. Let's all together make a name for ourselves. We'll all together pile up against God and we'll be able to rebel because we're all together. And of course, God shows that no, even a large crowd can't oppose God. So he'll, he'll take care of things. But yeah, that's this is yeah, it's one of the ways the pagans react. Yeah. Okay. Is it pagans that have been pushing this abortion thing so much? Well, sure. Because pagans have always seen, I mean, so I use pagans as a I mean, there is literally paganism out there. Yes, the worship of trees and winds and, and so on. I use pagans as slang for unbelieving world. Okay. Um, so unbelieving world has always been a world full of death. It's tried to celebrate death. Again, it doesn't understand the shame that death is. Death should never have been. It's the result of sin. But the world, in flaunting against sin now, wants to celebrate death. And so it's always celebrated death, whether it's the death of, of infants or whether it's the death of the weak or, or any of that stuff. That's the way the world works. Um, because it's in full rebellion to God. So it doesn't want life. It wants death. The whole, the whole sinful nature is just so wrecked that it doesn't even know what a good desire is to have. So desires the wicked, bad things like death. So they don't even—they're not even people seeing this as sin. Um. Well, I mean, they're not innocent, but they don't really see. I mean, they don't really see it as sin, as in they don't want to acknowledge God. I mean, to to acknowledge it as sin is to acknowledge that you have God. I mean, that, that there's someone who speaks to morality or to righteous and sinful things and they don't want to acknowledge that right now in general in times of the world's history there's there's this kind of general shame that comes and that has helped with the curb of the law keep societies kind of hemmed in uh but now we're seeing that kind of disappear there's just more open open flagrant rebellion against god it shows them in pride it's just that's the root of it, right? You, you get proud, you think you can oppose God, you know. Well, which, you know, for them, they don't see or know of God, they just see the church and they're like, Well, you church, you know. So, yeah, okay. All right, so it is full of immoral, immoral people, which you can't avoid in Galatians and Colossians. Paul says that the world, to be of the world, is to be enslaved to elementary spirits, or elemental spirits, sometimes it's translated, uh, fundamental spirit. It's, it, so it's the idea that the, the world without Christ, so the unbelieving world, is not free, okay? They're still enslaved, but they're enslaved to kind of this basic, wrong religion and so forth um obviously paul also talks in other places about actual demons and stuff that control things right but here it's talking about this kind of 
elementary religion, which is idol worship. You worship the creatures rather than the creator, a uh, thing that can be crafted, so forth. We see this in most primitive religion, right? It's the idea of works righteous deceptions. That is the most natural religion that man comes up with. If you do good, you get rewarded. If you do bad, you get punished. And so that is the most natural religion of all. And so that's how they think religion should be. And that's their enslavement. Because what that does is enslaves them to a wrecked conscience because they'll never live up to a standard. Right? They, they end up lowering the bar and try to lower the standard. But eventually they just keep having to lower it because they just can't keep meeting it. And so this is what brings them this wreck. But it's enslavement. Okay? You can see it in Earth, Sun, Moon, Star Worship. And then just a devotion to things earthly. And that's what it means to be enslaved to kind of elemental or elementary spirits in Galatians 4 and Colossians 2. And that is the way of the world. Okay, James 4.4, 4, I will go there because I think it's important for you to read that and probably have it impressed in your minds. I kind of almost think we should make like placards for it and put it above our doors, but probably not. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Okay. That's, that's a really hard verse because that's not how we really want to view the world. Because again, inside of us, we have a sinful flesh that always wants to be <laughs> not in the church, uh, but in the world and of the world. But there, there, James lays it out plain and simple. He uses that adulterous language like the prophet Hosea would, um, that spiritual adultery, right? Friendship with the world is enmity with God, meaning, yeah, if you want to be a friend with the world, you're going to have to be an enemy of God. Which means God and the world are opposed to each other. They're enemies. Okay? The world, being of the world, means you are defiled. Because again, if you are of the world, you are seeking after the things of power, glory, and honor. It's full of sin. It hates Christ. It hates Christ's people. It's ignorant of God. It's full of immoral immorality. It's enslaved to bad things, common things. It's opposed an, an enemy to God. And so obviously it defiles you. Um, here, here we're going to have all of the all the wreckage of the world in the coming decades. Um, you know, we're going to have we're going to have the people who got involved in every last movement and rainbow pride thing, and and you're going to see people who have to come out of that, and and they're going to come out of it chewed up and spit out, defiled, because that's what the world does. Now, it's no different than someone who gets into the realm. I mean, you just saw the other passage, you know, greed and so forth. You might not, you might not be someone who ever got involved with that stuff, but it got involved with so much greed and seeking after his own goods and stuff. That defiles too. Maybe just in a little less visible way. The ways of the world defile a person. And so that should be a warning. The ways of the world defile. Okay. Being of the world means you will be overcome by Christ. Okay? That at the end, um, whatever strength the world can muster against God, it will never be close to anywhere near enough. It loses. Those who are of the world lose. Okay? All of the world's kingdoms and all of its power, losers. Okay? That's just a fact. And that we that is something we will see unfold. Okay? And yes, it, in some ways it will be sad, but in other ways it will not be, because it will be God keeping his word. That's one of the warnings he's spoken to the world. That he is God, he will repay. This is the warning he speaks to rulers and things like that about their uh, godlessness or being anti-God, rebelling against him and his ways. Is that he says, yeah, you're going to find out. Yeah, Mike. 
But does that mean that we're not supposed to be utilized? Can't be part of the school system or you know on the school board or any other board. So in a second, we're going to talk about good works. And we're going to talk about where good works happen. And just like I've encouraged, you know, like living locally and stuff, good works happen in real places. And good works can happen as members of a household, members of a church, members of a community or a society, right? And so, so good works can happen in schools, on school boards, things like that. So there might be opportunity to do that. But it should always be done with those things in mind, however, that we have a strong warning about the ways of the world. And so it's not telling us to not engage, but it's telling us to be, be watchful as we engage. Because because that's that's the that's the temptation. And and so, like, for instance, right, the world seeks after power, honor, and glory. Well, we could engage and use the exact same tactics as them and gain for ourselves power, honor, and glory, but it would not be, we what? We've decided to become of the world because we're adopting their ways. But if you want to serve and you want to go into those things to, to, to be the kind of like, so for instance, school board, right? You want to go on the school board and an issue comes up where, uh, well, let's just use recent ones. Like there's, there's books that have age inappropriate material being promoted in libraries for grades that are too young will you as a christian have an obligation to keep, take your christianity into that board meeting and say listen this is inappropriate material for fifth graders this is totally out of this is you, you don't have to use ungodly you could say ungodly this is sinful but the world won't understand you in fact probably you know mark against you but if you say this is age inappropriate this is not at all proper, you know, and you use your voice and your citizenship and then your talents to get elected and so forth for the service of godliness, even amongst the pagans, at least wanting that curb of the law to happen, that's a good thing. So again, we do get engaged, we do get involved, but the way we do shouldn't reflect that. It reflects a different understanding. It reflects a love of the neighbor um, rather than a love of self. Because most of these things are totally selfish. That's the way the world is. Okay? Good question. It's not an easy, it's not an easy thing, and, and it's going to involve a lot of consciences having to make decisions, and then probably a lot of Christian consciences making the wrong decision. <laughs> But then, of course, what does a Christian do when a Christian makes a wrong decision? Repents, goes back to the forgiveness of sins. And this happens in workplaces and everything else all over. Christian in a hard spot has to make a decision, makes a decision, later realizes, ah, what do you do? Repent. See the forgiveness of sins. Do, do better next time. I mean, whatever you want, however you want to phrase that. Yeah. Dave. Speaking for myself and of myself, I'd like to add a couple things to your top line there. <laughs> okay. Personal pleasure. You. Yeah. And self-satisfaction. Oh, totally. Yeah. I was just talking to somebody the other day. You know, the, uh, the, the phrase self-care has become very important in our world. And, and it's not to say, I mean, Jesus took time by himself to go away, you know, these kind of things. So there is an aspect of that in the scriptures. But the way the world describes self-care is what? You're so caring for yourself, you totally forget about the rest. At best, they'll try to say, well, you care for yourself in order to help others. And that gets close to the Christian understanding of why you would take time away. Okay? Why we would take time away as Christians? Well, a little bit of rest, but also what did Jesus do when he went away? Get great. <laughs> Rest and refreshment. Refreshment in God's word. Right? Uh, that's that's a proper Sabbath. That's a proper self-care, so to speak. And then it's really not self-care. You're doing God's word. God's taking care of us. So I mean, it's not really self-care. Anyway. All right. So we're going to get into the category of good works. And I have like five slides, which means we'll cover the first half of this one. 
All right. Um, the whole point of you being in this world. So God baptized you, made you his child, redeemed you, you know, applied the forgiveness of sins to you that Jesus went on the cross here to you here and now. But then God didn't take you to heaven. Okay? It's not like you were baptized and immediately God said, okay, come on. Instead, he left you here. Okay? He put you in a family. He put you in a church. He put you in a community. Why? Well, one of the main reasons is this. Good works. That there are good things that need to be done for the sake of all the other people around you in your home, in your church, and in your community. And so this is why we're going to spend this time talking about this, because being a Christian inevitably puts you in the category of doing good. Okay? We as God's people are left here on earth, never alone, but we're here on earth for this purpose. To do good. And by that our good works would speak of our God. Okay? And so this is what it is. So good works are not the root or cause of or even contributing to our salvation. So again, just you've got to keep those distinct of one another. You can't take how you are saved, how you are justified, how you are righteous, and try to put your works in there. Because what it does is your works are so imperfect that if you try to apply them to your salvation, it's just going to crumble apart. Okay? See Roman Catholic theology. Right? That's, that's, you add works into the mist, you'll never be sure of your salvation. You'll always question, always doubt it. Because if it hinges on your works, you're lost. You can't do it. So that's just always the key, to keep that reminder. Now, with that, I will point out our colleague today in church. Oh, Lord, we pray that your grace may always go before and follow after us, that we may continually be given to all good works. So yes, it's a prayer about good works, but how did it start? That God's grace would always go before and follow after us, meaning we need God's grace in order to do good works, but then even after our good works are done, we still need God's grace. Okay? It, 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 our, good work, our good works will never save us. God's grace does that. Okay? So we don't need to mix those categories. We don't need to take our works and mix them in. But we do want to talk about works because that is what God's got you to do. We just don't want to get them confused. Okay. Yeah, here. I think one of the things you gotta say about this is that good works, even though you do some, we don't counteract all the bad works. No, it, it's not a scale. And even <laughs> when you do it the best you can, it's an imperfect right? So yes. It's so we're getting there. We're getting there. So yeah, we're not gonna be at a scale. So it's not gonna be like in the end, I measure my good things versus my bad. That's Islam. That's not Christianity. Okay, um, and also, uh, as Gary says it, but as I'll, as I'll teach them, your good works are always going to be marred because of your sinful nature. Okay, meaning you will never be able to produce a perfect good work on your own. Okay, your sinful nature won't let that happen. It's always going to have your grubby fingerprints on it. Okay, this is why a good work requires faith in Jesus to be considered a good work. Because your good works will always, you know, they'll always be short something. That's where you believe in Jesus and he makes all the difference. Okay? That's why an unbeliever cannot do a good work. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God, it says in Hebrews. Okay? So, um, good works are not to be included anywhere near our justification before God. That is by faith in Christ alone. Okay? So what are good works? Ten commandments plus faith in Jesus. Okay? Again, plus faith in Jesus. You, you have to have faith for there to actually be a good work. So why do we go to the law for this? Because self-chosen or man-made works in worship are rejected. So this is from, I think, Chemnitz. Okay, so one of the reasons why we want to go to the Ten Commandments is because we often want to come up with our own. 
and that's our self-chosen, self-made commandments, which will no doubt be things that you know we want to do. And then guess what? Our sinful nature gets playing. Uh, yeah, I really, really benefit from this. We go to Ten Commandments of God because that's God's will. And then we know for sure this is good. This is God pleasing. This is what God wants. When we do our self chosen stuff, oftentimes conflicts with the commandments. Okay? Good works are not optional for Christians. That works be sanctified by the Word of God, which tells us what they are, and the Holy Spirit who prepares them for us. Right? So, again, so our works become good because of God, faith in Jesus, then we have. The righteousness of Jesus applied to our whole life. Okay, so we are standing righteous, we do good and so forth. But also then the Holy Spirit he mentions, and this is Ephesians 2.10, right? That we would do good works prepared beforehand for us that we might walk in them. That our good works are set up before us by God. Okay. So in a way, it's like, yes, he's the motivation for our doing good works. He fills in the gap to make sure that they are good works by the righteousness of Christ. But then also, he's the one who made them possible to start with. He prepared them beforehand. This is why we pray for grace to follow, come before us and follow after us as we seek to do good works. That can, by continual use of the law, we would also still have constant reminders of our sins against the law. So even as we engage in the study about good works and being a Christian and so forth, God's law will do what it always does. It will show us our sins. So even as I'm learning how to better serve my neighbor by looking at the commandments, it's going to show me, okay, I've sinned there. I didn't do what I should have. You know, I did what I shouldn't have. So you're going to always have that. Anytime you interact with the law, that's going to happen. Yeah, but we know what to do with that. That's a matter of confession and forgiveness. Okay? So even as we study and learn how to do good to our neighbor, yep, we're going to have sins showing up, but we know how to deal with that. You know who to seek for our help, our forgiveness on that. Okay, Self-appointed or man-made works are often set up to make us feel perfect. <laughs> so as we use God's law, it's going to show our imperfection, which will aid us in our dependence on Jesus still. And then if we go with self-appointed stuff, we'll probably get further from Jesus because we think we're doing it. Okay. So good works are done to God through our neighbor. So this is why, uh, it, when it talks about wives and husbands, uh, submit to the husband as unto the Lord. But these things are done to God, but through the neighbor. Right? Uh, when it tells uh, employees to do a good job, uh, even slaves to obey their masters, it says to do so because of God. <laughs> that you're doing your work as unto the Lord. Okay? So that's, that's to whom they are done. Uh, they are done to God, but they are done through our neighbor. So sometimes you'll see, well, you do them unto your neighbor. Well, sure, but it's unto the neighbor to God. Okay. Um, they're going to be looked at two different ways. So this fancy Latin, before God versus before the world. So this is why the world can still try to praise some people who are unbelievers. Because for the world, there's certain things that are praised as good works. Now, what's the real conflict coming is the fact that God commands certain good works and the world is now going to consider them to not be virtues anymore, but to be vices, right? So you, you know, advocating for male and female, man and woman marriage, now the world gives you the accusation that you are now in the vice of, of bigotry, you know? Um, okay. But before God, he would have you make the right confession of what it is marriage he made and what he instituted. So then when we get into good works, we're going to talk stewardship. That is how you use the things of God. And so the question would be, what isn't God's? Yeah. Does any part of my life not relate to God being my God? And if you can answer that with, yeah, there's certain parts that don't relate to God being my God. Uh, question to follow up that with would be, is that good? And of course, it's not good. You want every aspect of your life to be uh, with, with God in the picture. Okay? Uh, that we can't check out from God. There's no place where we can be like, well, okay, now I can finally be godless. No. But that's, I mean, 
But that's a temptation put before you. That's a temptation that comes with persecution. Listen, you can have your God stuff over there, but over here, just... just you no? Know? Uh, the, the Roman emperor, when he persecuted the early church at times, how you, how you did it was you went and you pinched a bit of incense to Caesar. You could go right to church from there if you wanted. But you had, to, you had to prove Caesar's divinity by doing that act of worship. No. Um, the earliest church that per, that's persecuted by the Jews? Think of it. You can you just give up Jesus. You can have the synagogue. You can have the temple. You can have your family, your friends back, your way of life back, your Levitical rules and regulations and dietary laws. All that can come back. It can be normal. Just like the rest of Just give up Jesus. Okay. So there were people, there were Christians who tried to live in both worlds, right? Or tried to be of both, right? Um, and that's that's a dangerous spot to be in, but it's a very common temptation, especially when there's level of persecution. You know, um, the, the communists did this very often in the Soviet Union. You know, they, they never got rid of the Christian church. But again, it was... Children can't be taught it. You know, they'll keep it around because some of those old people still cling to that stuff. Uh, but it was just, you know, if it's anything, it's just an accessory in your life or a little add-on you have. Because your main life is here with the state. Okay? And that's, you know, there's no aspect of life that is not done in relation to God. Okay? All right, questions on that? Yeah. But he all said the exact same thing where at the end time there is the screen and uh, God puts everything you've done in your entire life on the screen and like all the bad things, none of the good stuff. Huh. And then uh, Jesus is standing right there watching it and you're cringing every time he shows you that. Yeah. And then uh, it's a, it's just like, oh, okay, I hear you, whatever. Uh, well, I, I'm glad those are non-Lutheran pastors saying that. Okay. Um, so you want to read how, how Jesus does the last part? Read Matthew 24, the parable, the, or the, the teaching on the sheep and the goats. Okay. Because what he what he brings up before everyone and what he speaks up before everyone is honestly the good works. And in front of the unbelievers, he brings up the things they didn't do. But in front of the sheep, he says, you did this, and you did this, and you did this. And the sheep are like, huh? They didn't do any of that. See, this is the thing, right? Good works are done in the grace of God coming before and after us. God actually kind of does them through us. So we don't always know the good works that we do. Whereas the unbelieving world, if they're told they aren't doing it, guess what, they, guess what the ghosts respond with? When did we not do that? Because the world tries to keep track. So uh, I would say that, that that is a terrifying prospect. Um, yeah, that's not how Jesus speaks about the end. So I'll go with what Jesus says. I would encourage you to do the same. And uh, I don't know, some of those passions are wrong. <laughs> Or not. So, or just ask them, you know, well, how about the sheep and the goats? Because the sheep actually are just confessing their sins at the end, like, I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. That's what Christians always do confess their sins. That's what Jesus for our redemption. So, other last minute questions? Otherwise, we'll pray. All right, let us pray. Well, Lord, we pray that your grace may always go before and follow after us. We may continually be given to all good works. In Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>